Is that one for now. So, if you want your presentation slides to be error-free, use spell checker, don't you? And that's what I did here, and the spell checker somehow didn't complain. Uh, maybe you can help me and proofread this. Do you see any errors with that? No. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. So, that is not correct, and other problems? Yeah, right. So, for those who didn't see it, whoops, I'm skipping a slide, it seems. So, this one, that was spelled wrong, and um, yeah, it always skips two slides, and uh, pigeon was wrong. Oops. So, you probably knew that um, spell checking won't find all the, the errors you make. And we've been working on a solution to that, uh, and you can try it on languagetool.org. When you paste these two sentences into the, the form and you check them, uh, it will find both these errors and it will also make proper corrections. And that's what this talk is about, what comes after spell checking. Here's a short roadmap of the talk. First, I'll explain how we use language tool to find a million errors in the Wikipedia. And then I'll explain how language tool work, works internally. I'll explain what approach we are using for language tool and what other approaches could be used for style and grammar checking and why we are not using those other approaches. And then I'll um, make a suggestion how we can start fixing these million errors we found. Finally, I'll then talk about uh, the future work we are planning for language tool. Uh, first, a small survey. So, how many people of you here have heard about language tool? Okay, not so many. How many have actually used it? Uh, not so many. Okay, that's why I'm here. So, how do you find a million errors in Wikipedia? Basically, by running this command. Uh, language tool uh, wikipedia.jar, it's actually not part of the standard language tool distribution because it's kind of very specific. Checking the Wikipedia is not what the average user does all day. So it's part, you need to download the nightly builds to get this command. And then it takes three parameters. Check data means like uh, check uh, an XML dump from Wikipedia and then you specify the path to that XML dump, which is several gigabytes in size and you specify EN, which is just a language code for English. And then it will start and it will give you um, results like this. So it will print the title of the article where it thinks it found an error. It will um, give the location of the error and it will give you a message and the error with some kind of ASCII underline. And in this uh, case, you can see there's an error. It says, will designated as, but it should be, will be designated as. And the, so language tool actually found the, found the problem, but the message is, is a bit off. So the suggestion is not quite correct, but at least it found the error. So if you run this command, you get a lot of these errors, a lot of these, this output. Um, running it on the English Wikipedia takes about 10 milliseconds per sentence. But because the English Wikipedia is so very large, that would take about one week or so on my computer to run through the entire Wikipedia. So what we actually did was we ran language tool on 20,000 articles, which led to about 37,000 potential errors. So what's an error now? For the sake of simplicity, I will just talk about errors uh, when I mean grammar errors or style suggestions. It does not include uh, simple spelling mistakes that, that a common spell checker could find. And if you project this number of 37,000 potential errors to the whole Wikipedia, which has more than 4 million articles, you get 8 million potential errors. And of those, we selected 200 uh, randomly and checked them manually to see how many of these eight projected 8 million errors would actually be useful. So how many of these are actual errors? And the result is 
that in the whole Wikipedia, if we ran language tool really over the whole Wikipedia, you'd get about one million errors that are actually useful. And as I said, that does not count simple spelling errors we have because we have turned them off. It's just there are too many proper names and so in Wikipedia you'd, you'd get too many, even more false alarms. So, still, we have 8 million potential errors and only 1 million useful errors. So, it's kind of like too many false alarms, you might say. And uh, the reason, there are several reasons for that. First, it's surprisingly difficult to um, extract text from the English Wikipedia. They use this media wiki syntax, and one problem we have with that is currently we cannot expand the templates. So you have an, a text like an elevation of about 150 meters. That's what you see when you read the Wikipedia. But in the wiki syntax it has this, this template syntax and we currently cannot expand this. So we only get an elevation of about and then a space. So that will of course uh, in several uh, instances confuse the grammar checker. You also have as an encyclopedia obviously many place names and uh, movie titles and any kinds of names in your text and also non-English place names and it's also uh, difficult for, for some kind of proof reading tool to handle. You also have uh, cases like articles about math where you have sentences like the value of n for a given a is called something and here the word a is used in two different two different meanings. The first one is uh, the determiner, as you would expect, and the other one is kind of a math symbol. And we, as we are not, as language tool is not optimized for articles about math, that will also confuse language tool. Now, if you use language tool or any proofreading tool on, an, on articles that have already been checked quite well, you will obviously get more, fo more false alarms. And most of the articles in the English Wikipedia have already been checked. Also, our English rules still need to approve, so we get less false alarms. So here are some uh, examples of the bad matches, so not so useful matches that you get. It says 68 thousand assembler in the text and language tool suggests to use assemblers, the plural form. Because it doesn't know that 68,000 assembler is actually kind of a, a product name here. Or you have cases like score voting and majority judgment allow these voters and language tool incorrectly suggests to use uh, the third person singular because here the reason is that the detection of the noun phrase doesn't work properly. So in this case, language tool only detects majority judgment as the noun phrase and not score voting and majority judgment. So that leads to a, a, to a false alarm. And finally, this example from the math article where it suggests to use N because the is starts with a vowel sound and usually, if that is the case, you use N instead of, of A. But of course, here are some useful matches. In a vote of 27 journalists from 22 Gaming Magazine, uh, language tool suggests to use magazines, the plural form. Okay, the next one is easy. This just flows through through the body. It suggests to use, to remove the duplication. And sending back their work to the teacher's computer, it properly detected there's an apostrophe missing. Here's an example for a style alarm you might get. Um, if you write something like there are many different variations, language tool suggests to use just many. That's because uh, variations kind of implies the different already. And whether you agree, of course, uh, with these style suggestions, it's kind of up to you whether you consider these useful. So some examples of um, errors which we cannot detect. These are not from Wikipedia now, I made them up. So we cannot detect semantic problems, of course, like Barack Obama is the president of France. Uh, that, won't, that won't trigger any error. 
If you write something like, I made a concerted effort, your English teacher will tell you that concerted implies more than one person was involved. So that's not correct, but we won't detect that now. And if you write a sentence like, tomorrow I go shopping, it should be tomorrow I will go shopping. That's also a case which we don't detect yet. Um, now you could write rules maybe for these, but they would be very specific. I will talk in a few minutes about how to write rules. And then you will probably see that you uh, could write rules for these cases, but it's doubtful if it's, if it's actually useful. So, here's a short overview about language tool. The basic idea of language tool was always to, to be the next step after spell checking. So we don't replace spell checking, but we kind of run after spell checking. And nowadays, we actually have one component that does a um, traditional spell checking. We have that component inside of language tool. The project was started in 2003. It's released under LGPL. We have about 10 regular committers now, and we are on a time-based release schedule with a new release every three months. And everything is implemented in Java and XML. You'll see in a few minutes what, why, why we use XML, or what for. So as a user, how to use language tool, you can use it either as a command line application, or on the desktop, we have also several extensions for LibreOffice and OpenOffice, Vim and Emacs, and Firefox and Thunderbird, and even a few more. If you're from the Java world, you can directly use our API. And if you're, from, you're using some other um, language, then you might use our embedded HTTP server. We also have an HTTPS server, which returns some very simple XML, which you can then uh, pass to see the errors in your text. Now, how does this work internally? Language tool takes plain text as input. It then um, finds the sentences in this text, and in these sentences, it finds the words. And for each word, it, it analyzes the word. For example, it finds its base form. For walks, you will get the base form walk, for example. And you will also find the part of speech text for each word. Uh, which can be ambiguous. For example, in the case of walks, you would get, it can be a plural noun, or it can also be a third person singular verb. Now we have this analyzed text, and then we, over this analyzed text, we run some Java rules, but most importantly, we run over that some error detection patterns. These patterns are kind of the core of language tool, and I'll now explain how these work. The basic idea behind these error detection patterns is to be first simple, so you don't have to be a software developer to contribute new rules. And the other idea of patterns is that they are all independent. So even if you add a new rule, you cannot break any of the existing rules. That's often unlike in software development where you, you change something and something else uh, breaks. <coughs> Here's an example of a, a slightly simplified example of a rule. Rule always consists of two parts. The first part is the pattern itself. So first I should say that error detection patterns, we internally call them rules. So a rule consists of those two parts, the pattern itself, and a message that is displayed to the user when that pattern uh, is found in a sentence. And the pattern, again, is just a sequence. In, a, in the simplest case, it's just a sequence of words. So in this uh, example, you have um, the token bet, and token is just a technical term for word, followed by the regular expression English or attitude. So this pattern will just match the example from the first slide, bad English and also bad attitude. And in the message, you then can see that back reference, it will just use that backslash to to replace that with English or attitude. So the, the user gets to see the message, did you mean bad English, for example. Uh, 
Okay, that was a very simple example. Other things you can do in your rules are you can use logical end and or, you can use negation, you can do skipping, like match a word, then skip over n words and then match another word. Or you can use inflection, that means do not just match the word walk, but also all of its forms without writing them all down. For example, for walk, it would match walking, walks, and walked. And you can match part of speech patterns, like match all verbs, or match only all third-person singular verbs. And that's described on our wiki in detail. Okay, and because this is kind of the core of language tool, I give you one more example. This detects the error in always I am happy. That's uh, actually a mistake that a non-native English speaker might make. And I'm taking these examples, as you can see, from the bottom of the rule, because uh, at least two examples are part of the, the rule. One example needs to be incorrect. That means it needs to match the pattern above. And the other example needs to be correct, so it must not match the pattern above. We use these rules, these examples inside the rule, uh, for our unit tests. And it also makes it easier to understand what the rule actually does. So this rule has some kind of uh, first token send start, which just means match only at the start of the sentence. And then it has a regular expression again, always, hardly, or never. And then it has uh, a token with an exception, which means that it will match all tokens except those. And those are those VB, MD, and JJ. VB means verb, any kind of verb. Uh, MD means modal, and JJ means adjective. Now, if that sounds confusing to you, we didn't make these up. These um, tag names are actually standard in computational linguistics. It's called the pantry bank tag set, and that's what we use here. Now we have these kind of rules for 29 languages, which technically means we support 29 languages, but we support them to a very different degree. You can see here, I guess if you cannot read this, the uh, languages with the most number of rules are French, German, Catalan, Polish, and then comes English. So French, for example, has uh, more than 2,000 rules, and there are other languages like Greek and Japanese that have less than 100 rules. This means that, although this is only a very rough indication of how good a language is support supported, um, it's an indication that, of course, if you use the, if you switch language tool to Japanese or Greek, it will not work that well in the sense that you will not find so many errors. So that means you, we will have to do a lot of work here for, for those languages with, with lesser rules uh, to get a be better coverage. So what we do is basically pattern matching. And you might wonder, um, language is kind of complicated. Is, is pattern matching really enough? Or ask in a different way, why don't we use a more powerful approach? So let's take one step back and ask, uh, what is grammar actually? Grammar is a set of rules that describe how valid words, sentences, and text look like. And syntax is a part of grammar that is a more or less formal description of how a valid sentence looks like. And you can also ask what's a parser. A parser is something that takes a sequence as input and generates you some output structure, typically a tree, for example. And you know this from software development, where we do this successfully for decades. And so you might ask, why don't we just do the same for English? Why can't we just write a parser, like we have a parser for Python or whatever, why can't we just write this kind of parser, parser uh, for English? Uh, so it turns out we kind of could, but that's not the approach we are taking in language too, because it's just so very difficult. So there is no formal description of the English grammar but if you look in, in a comprehensive grammar book, you, 
you'll find that is, and you consider this to be some kind of specification, you'll find that this ha has um, 1,700 pages. And even if you say now, okay, this is just English, English is kind of special or complicated or whatever, and you look at a constructed language like Esperanto, which should be much easier, you still have a specification, if you want to call that that way, of uh, about 700 pages. So that's complicated. Also, if you if you write such a parser, um, you will more or less uh, end up with a parser that's probably specific to your language. And we want to support more more than one language uh, in language tool. Even more reasons why it's difficult to, to use a parser to parse English. Having a parser does not automatically mean that you have good error messages. So you basically, even if you have your parser, you need to go one step further and optimize it to get useful error messages because otherwise you'll get uh, parser messages like I cannot pass the sentence, which is not useful to the average user. And even if you have done all that, you're still not finished because if you look at sentences like sorry for my bad English from the first slide, uh, it turns out that it actually passes fine because bad English could also be some noun phrase. Sorry for my and then some noun phrase. So technically, sorry for my bad English is a grammatically correct phrase. So there are parsers actually like this. For example, there's link grammar that's also open source and it's used in Abbey Word an open source uh, word processing software. So you can go this approach and try to write a parser for English. But it's difficult. And because we from Language Tool, we want to support a lot of languages, uh, that's not the approach we are, we are taking. But I'm not saying, saying it's bad or, or something, it's just difficult. You might also wonder, why don't you use machine learning and statistics and so on? First, we do use Apache OpenNLP for finding the chunks. And chunks is another name for phrases. So Apache OpenNLP gets us the noun phrases and verb phrases. And that's based on a statistical approach which has been trained. And we use it as a kind of black box to find those phrases. However, if you want to use a statistical approach or machine learning or whatever to actually find the errors in a text, you'd need some large corpus where all the errors have been annotated. And then you need probably another large corpus where you know this is free of errors. And then you could maybe come up with some kind of training um, uh, to get a model and then you could use that. But it's not so easy to, to find these annotated errors. You'd have to annotate a lot of errors and while the situation for English uh, is quite good, you get a lot of uh, resources and um, the, the English Wikipedia, for example, is huge. But we also want to support languages that have, have not so many resources. So that's kind of difficult. It's difficult to use machine learning. But again, I'm here again, I'm not saying that this is a bad approach to use this. If you have some idea how to use machine learning to uh, to proofread the text automatically, feel free to do that. And even then you can kind of plug in into a language tool, which is by writing your own rule in Java. And that works like this. You only implement, simply implement uh, one single method from the rule class, the match method. And it gets uh, an, as input an analyzed sentence and that's what the class name suggests, is a sentence with its tokens, and the tokens have their analysis. So they're base forms, and they are part of speech text, and then you can do with this whatever you want. You can run any logic you want. And you could even actually ignore our analysis of base forms and part of speech text and just look at the original text. And if you think you found uh, some match, then you create a rule match and thus uh, just return that. So that's quite, uh, quite easy to integrate into language tool. And if you do this, you get all the 
uh, stuff we do for free, like the user, um, the graphical user interface, the command line interface, and the extensions. So it's surely better to to plug in into this mechanism than to start writing your own grammar checker, where you would have to write all the plug plugins from scratch and so on. So now you have some overview about how language tool works. But uh, we still have that million errors from Wikipedia. Now how do we fix them? Well, as I said, we do not have, really have one million errors in our database because first we are only running on a small virtual server and the second reason is I think having one million errors actually listed in your database uh, is kind of overwhelming and it wouldn't probably motivate anyone to start fixing those. I mean, who wants to work on a to-do list with one million items? So what you can do is you can have a look at uh, community.languagetool.org where we list a few thousand errors and if it's a false alarm you can log in and mark it as a false alarm and if it's not a false alarm you can actually click on a link that I'll show in a minute and fix it, fix the problem in the Wikipedia. So what we use here is checking the XML dumps from Wikipedia. So that's not really a live view. Those dumps are created uh, every two weeks or so. Okay, and as we have a million errors, that probably won't get you very far. So what I suggest is actually something else. As a first step, we have a new feature where we check the recent changes from Wikipedia. We fetch this uh, atom feed of recent changes twice a minute and then we run language tool over it. Not over the complete articles but only about those parts that have actually changed. And then we detect if someone has made an edit that has, had <coughs> that has introduced an error. And we also usually detect whether someone has made an edit that has fixed an error. So what we end up with in the end is we have a database of freshly introduced errors. It looks like this. So you have the error message and with the blue squiggly underline uh, the error. Now there are two cases. Uh, one case is that it is a false alarm, then you can click it is a false alarm or you can just ignore it. But now assume like in this very first example it's actually an error. What you can do then is click on the check page now link. And in that moment we go to the Wikipedia and fetch the current version of the article via the Wikipedia API and run the complete article through language tool. And we will then show you this, this page where you can, if everything works well, without typing anything, you can just click on the corrections made by language tool if they are useful and if it's not a false alarm. And then submit that page and we will send you directly to Wikipedia. So that's as if you had made uh, an edit in the Wikipedia. And you end up in this diff view where you can, one la for the last time, check that we didn't break anything. And we also conveniently uh, set this edit summary and check the, this is a minor edit checkbox, because usually it is, it's just a, some kind of grammar or spelling fix. So this is what I would suggest as a first step. Instead of working on those one million errors which are somewhere more or less hidden, uh, let's start and try to make sure that not so many new errors get introduced in the Wikipedia. Using for example this tool. It's not yet activated for all languages. But if you, you feel keen to actually use it and to maybe optimize it in the sense that you um, improve the rules or disable rules that are not so useful, then let me know which, about which language you want, to be act, you want to have activated and I'll try to do that. For now it's activated I think for uh, German, English and French.
So finally, some words about uh, the future work on language tool without working, walking you through our entire to-do list. What I'd basically like to see, of course, is to become a uh, spell and grammar checking ubiquitous. Style and grammar checking ubiquitous like spell checking already is today. You basically cannot type anywhere being uh, spell checked. And I think we shouldn't stop there. We have now more powerful tools. We can do style and grammar checking, so we should use it. <coughs> and what's the current state? Well, we do have a stable Java API. We are also available on Maven Central. It's useful for Java developers. We have an HTTP and HTTPS API for more or less easy integration. We have support for many languages. We have a license that I think should be liberal enough for almost all use cases. Uh, and we are written in Java, which is an absolutely good thing if, you are, if your software is also written in Java. If your software is not written in Java, uh, you might uh, not like that. <laughs> so how can we, despite being written in Java, how can we become ubiquitous? For example, how could we ever run in a browser despite, despite being implemented in Java? So my idea was to, can't we just compile Java to JavaScript with LLVM? Okay, I tried that and it failed. Uh, too bad nobody replied to my Stack Overflow question, but that's why I'm here, so I'm asking you for help. Maybe you can have a look at that question uh, and answer it, or even better, you, after the talk, you can come talk to me and explain to me how this is done, compiling a complex Java application to JavaScript. Of course, we are also happy to get help from people who want to add support for another language to language tool. It's not even that difficult. You can usually start with another language and then write one rule after the other. As I mentioned, we have a lot of languages that are not actively maintained or not actively maintained enough. So here's a list of languages that are really in need of a maintainer. And if you wanna maybe maintain these languages, we would be very happy to welcome you. Maintaining a language basically means writing new rules and making sure that the existing rules get improved and that they don't create too many false alarms. You don't have to be a software developer for that, but of course we also welcome software developers. Oh, sorry. So, as a summary, I'd like to say, I think today we shouldn't, shouldn't stick to simple spell checking that totally ignores context. We have more powerful checks available today, and I suggest you use them, either as a user or as a developer. And I hope that our style and grammar checking of Wikipedia is kind of a proof that this technology can be useful, despite the number of false alarms. And of course, your contributions are very welcome. You can talk to me after the speech. And uh, that's it from me. Have a nice conference. <laughs> are there any questions? Blue. Stand up. Should I repeat the question? The question is, how do you find errors in Japanese without any rules for Japanese? We do have rules for Japanese, just uh, not so many. What was that your question? I, I see zero in the database, so perhaps it's just me.
Okay, maybe in the meantime, uh, some other questions. We have another question here. Yeah. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Uh, can a language tool cope with texts with some markup, like LaTeX, or is it possible in near future, let's say, if it's not possible now? Uh, yes and no. So um, we kind of push this task to the software that integrates us. So what we demand of the software that uses language tool, that integrates language tool, is to tell us where the markup is. We need the position of the markup and then we will just ignore it. So if there's some software that can do this, that knows the markup and feeds us the text with including the uh, markup positions, then yes, we can handle that text. But we cannot handle that in a sense like we know, okay, this is now marked up as a, like a headline and then we have some special headline mode or so. That's not, we cannot do that yet. More questions? The question about the Java rules was misunderstanding. We have no Java rules for language tool, but we do have XML rules. So the Java rules are just some special cases if you prefer for some reason to write your rules in Java, or, because, or maybe your, the XML-based approach that I showed is not powerful enough, uh, then you can always write your rules in Java. And we have not done that for Japanese. Okay. Any other question? Okay, it seems not. You can come to me now and ask me. Thank you.